Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode. I'm very excited today. I have a special guest, and um, I can't wait to ask him questions and learn more about him and Q. So Dr. Levy Seti, he's a seasoned leader in the global clinical development. He's, he's currently the, the chief medical officer at Q Biopharma. Uh, but he also held like prominent roles in various pharma companies, including DNA Tricks, Dauntless Pharmaceuticals, Mirati Therapeutics, and he directed clinical and immuno-oncology programs there. Dr. Levisetti's extensive background includes leadership positions at Rush, Pfizer, and academic appointment at Washington University School of Medicine. He holds an MD from the University of Chicago, uh, School of Medicine, and he completed advanced training in endocrinology and immunology. Dr. Levisetti, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Ruben. That's a very generous um, introduction. I'm uh, very happy to have the opportunity to, to speak with you today about uh, uh, our, our work at Q Biopharma um, and also, uh, you know, my journey and, and background in, in this field. I love it. Um, so why we don't start, and maybe you can tell me a bit about Q Biopharma, and then we can drift and talk about the, the, the recent trials and the results. Sure. So Q Biopharma uh, is a, a clinical stage uh, a biotech company. Um, uh, we're, we're made up of uh, approximately 50 employees. Mm -hmm. uh, the company is, is based in, in Boston. Um, and as I mentioned, um, we have uh, two, two uh, potential drugs uh, in the clinic. Um, we have a, a very unique uh, platform, uh, which uh, really um, are, are T cell uh, engagers. So it's a T cell engager that uh, selectively delivers uh, the cytokine IL2 tumor specific T cells. And so I think, you know, we, we've really learned over, over the past decade, you know, it's, it's been really quite a bit of an advance uh, with regards to uh, the immunotherapy of cancer with the approval of checkpoint inhibitors like pembrolizumab and nivolumab that that the patients with cancer harbor uh, t-cells that are capable of recognizing cancer cells and, and eradicating them and and so uh, patients now um quite a few uh, we were striving to, to have that uh, number of patients become many more but you know about 10% of patients treated with checkpoint inhibitors in most indications have very durable uh, responses. And, and so really even complete responses uh, or, or really significant control of, of their cancer for, for several years, for you know, even three, four, five years. Um, and so um, what, what uh, our company has done is developed a, a protein therapeutic platform that, that um, selectively um, engages those T cells that mediate that immune uh, response against the cancer um, and gets them to become active, to expand. Um, and, and we've dialed in um, a specificity in, 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 the, in the platform where um, the, the, the immunostat is what we call the drug, um, only uh, selectively engages with tumor-specific T cells. So, so you know, we, we harbor uh, an enormous T cell repertoire of specificities, okay, um, of which only a tiny fraction uh, is um, capable of, of responding to um, a tumor cell and killing it. So it's probably less than 99.99% of T cells um, are specific for the cancer uh, in a patient. And all approaches to date have just non-selectively delivered a cytokine like IL-2 or, you know, a checkpoint blockade blocking the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway to all T cells. And, and this leads to, you know, uh, I think some, some efficacy, which has been an advance, but it's, it's limited, if you will. Um, and it also comes along with, with a lot of uh, toxicity, particularly... Uh, if you look at activating uh, cytokines like wild type IL-2 um, proleukin, which has been approved for a couple decades, um, uh, where basically the, the toxicity is so great that it's actually used very little. Um, so you have, you know, 80 to 90 percent of patients having, you know, grade three or greater, you know, really serious life-threatening toxicity uh, and a response rate less than 10 percent. 
So, so we, we, we thought, well, what if you could selectively only activate those T cells that you want active? And, and that's exactly what the immunostats do. The first one we took in uh, to, to the clinic uh, is in HPV positive head and neck cancer. Um, and the immunostat um, expands um, T cells that uh, are, are specific for the E7 peptide, which, which is um, uh, continuously um, uh, expressed in HPV positive epithelial cancers. And it's, presenting on the, it's presented on the surface of cancer cells. And so uh, the 101 immunostat uh, we, we, we give to the patient IV every three weeks, it expands uh, T cells that are HPV specific, and then those T cells go uh, and attack uh, and destroy the cancer. And so um, the data that, that, that we presented recently um, uh, at, at ASCO in an oral presentation uh, was an up-to-date overview of our findings. And so we've treated 80 patients uh, to date and we started treating patients in the second line setting and beyond. And so these are patients that had um, progressed on prior um, chemotherapy and checkpoint inhibitor. So those could be given in the current era together in the frontline treatment of uh, head and neck cancer or in either sequence, you know, over the last five years. So before the checkpoints became approved, uh, patients would get platinum based chemo. Um, and now, uh, more recently, with the approval of pembrolizumab in the first-line setting, there's also patients that can get upfront um, immunotherapy uh, followed by chemotherapy, um, uh, immunotherapy followed by chemotherapy. Um, and so the patients we enrolled, greater than 90% of them had received and progressed on prior treatment with both chemo and checkpoint. And what we have observed now is really a remarkable prolongation of survival. So totally unanticipated uh, median overall survival of 20, over, over 20 months, okay? And these are patients treated in the third line setting, okay? Second line and beyond. And if you look to the second line pivotal trials uh, with Pembro and Nevo, median overall survival was approximately eight months. So one line earlier, eight months. And so this is a single arm data set. We treated 20 patients at this uh, uh, recommended phase two dose of four uh, mg per kg. And we actually had to amend the protocol to uh, extend our follow-up uh, for patients because when we wrote the protocol, we did not anticipate any, uh, that any patients would live beyond two years. Um, and, and every year at ASCO, I would speak to our investigators and say, well, what would be interesting? You know, this is a single arm study, but what do you think? And, and they said, well, each year that, you know, if you have a median OS of a year of 12 months in this population, that would be notable. And now we're beyond 20 months. So we, we still have five of the, of the patients alive in, in, in follow up. Um, the other part of this trial was treating patients in the frontline setting. OK, so these are treatment naive. Uh, recurrent uh, metastatic HPV positive head and neck cancer. Um, and now we, we're treating patients in combination with pembrolizumab, uh, so which is approved in the first line setting. And here we've observed uh, an objective response rate of 46%. And, and if you compare that to the historical um, um, uh, response rate with pembrolizumab monotherapy, it was 19%. Uh, in, in the pivotal keynote 48 trial. So, so we see more than a doubling of response rate. These responses are very durable. The median duration of response has not been met, um, but, but several, I think five of our patients now are out um, um, beyond uh, two years. Um, the, the PFS in this population is, is approximately six months. So it's uh, twice that which was observed with keynote 48 with Pembro monotherapy. And then we have a 12 month overall survival rate of 96%. Um, and, and again, this, this, this is maturing data, um, but, but that compares very favorably to the historical rate of just over 50%. So, so really encouraging um, differentiated data uh, in the frontline setting when we treat uh, with the immunostat Q101 in combination uh, with pembrolizumab. And, and very importantly, uh, this combination is very well tolerated. So, so we, we don't see any synergistic toxicity. The tolerability profile looks like uh, Pembro monotherapy as it's defined in the label. Uh, and Q101, which uh, we've uh, defined now in over 100 patients, which 
of note, we, we don't see any um, capillary leak syndrome, uh, which was associated with wild type IL-2 therapy. Yeah, um, yeah. We, we've, we've only seen one adverse event of CRS, uh, which was grade one. So one patient with a fever out of 80 treated, some of them for up to two years. So like um, what the other side effects, like uh, were there like any other side effects that came like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, anything, one of those common things that happened? Yeah. So, so again, it, it looks very much like, you know, the, the disease, you know, in an advanced cancer, you know, population. So fatigue, anemia, decreased appetite. Um, we, we did see um, about 20 to 20 percent of patients had mild infusion reactions. Mm -hmm. generally with their first infusion, and then uh, no patients discontinued because of an infusion oh, reaction, wow. uh, and they were very easily managed. So we didn't pre-medicate up front, but if a patient had an infusion reaction, we would then um, pre-medicate on, on subsequent um, cycles. So we actually still have five patients on treatment, uh, a combination of 101 with pembrolizumab, um, and, and of the, uh, the 25 we treated at the recommended uh, combo dose, um, 20 of those patients remain alive in follow-up. So, so it really, uh, the, the survival um, data uh, it really looks very favorable, you know, as, as it matures. And, and, and so it's really great for these patients. Um, and, and our investigators are really enthusiastic, you, you know, um, about this as a potential you know, option. Um, it is, yeah, it is. It's very exciting. Yeah. yeah, it's very exciting. The combination, you know, in the front frontline setting with uh, of pembrolizumab with um, chemotherapy, you know, th that data, if you look at the four-year follow-up from Kena 48, you know, it looks very strong. So their median overall survival was 14 months. So it was, mm -hmm. it was, it was longer than uh, the Pembro Mono. Um, but, but again, if, if you look at what the, the patients go through, um, you know, that's a chemo regimen that had, you know, 70, 80 percent, you know, frequency of treatment related grade three or graded, greater adverse events, you know, mm -hmm. which are well known with chemotherapy. But, but again, it, it's quite a different experience for, for a patient uh, in the frontline setting uh, yeah. to not have a lot of those uh, toxicities. For sure. You know. For sure. Uh, and th this is very interesting, like the toxicities, I think like if, when, when you see like this a uh, huge uh, response, also like you worry about the toxicities, but it sounds like the toxicities are not that, um, but or are not limiting for the treatment at this point. And I was wondering, um, like going from here, are you guys planning to like launch uh, more advanced like phase three trials or maybe expanding the indications and trying it in other types of cancers? Like there are tons of cancers, uh, but usually happens by HPV. I'm, I'm, yeah, no, no, it's a great question. So uh, we're, we're planning a, a randomized phase two trial uh, with two doses of 101 um, okay. in combination with pembrolizumab compared to pembrolizumab monotherapy. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we had a very productive interaction with the FDA earlier this year, um, and, and, and this is uh, re really what was uh, now aligned with the expectation and recommendation um, I'm sure you're familiar with with uh, what, what really is a mandate by the FDA uh, called Project Optimus mm -hmm. to optimize the selection of, of dose uh, in, in combination immunotherapy regimens. Um, th this also gives us an opportunity to, um, again, confirm that which we observe, you know, in a randomized controlled trial. Um, before, you know, investing and in going into a large pivotal phase three. Um, and, and some of that, again, you know, is it, it's moving forward, it needs to be funded. And we're, 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 we're a small biotech and, and the scope and cost of, of a randomized phase two with less than 100 patients compared to a pivotal phase three with 600 patients uh, is vastly different. So that's our plan. I agree. Regarding your question, it's a fantastic question, and I, you know, I just wish we had more resource to do more because, um, uh, as you allude to, and I'm sure know very well, that that there's a whole other you know set of HPV-driven cancers where there's mm -hmm. really a huge unmet need, and and that includes cervical cancer, probably as the yeah, next exactly. prevalent, head yeah. neck cervical. 
remarkable. Um, and then some genitourinal, you know, which are just terrible, you know, vaginal, penile, um, vulvar cancels, which, which are really nasty, you know, uh, malignancies. And so based on what we're observing, um, uh, particularly in combination with the checkpoint inhibitor, I think there's a very strong rationale to, to consider going into, for example, cervical, right? Mm -hmm. the, the front line yeah. standard of care is a checkpoint inhibitor plus chemotherapy. So, yep. so to consider, you know, a combination up front, um, you know, particularly in patients with, you know, advanced disease, the diagnosis ma makes a lot of sense. So it's just a matter of, uh, of, of resource and, and, and uh, of being able to do that. But, but, but again, it, it should really have, I mean, it should work in a way that's very much analogous because, you know, we, we, uh, uh, the, 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 the HPV, um, you know, genome, the, the, there's a component of it. So there's different parts of it that have different peptides that are expressed. With different by the cell cycle. And, and the E7, it seems to be really ubiquitously expressed in all of these HPV-driven cancers. So if you have an HPV-16 cervical cancer, it's, a, it's a, 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 a absolutely rational and good target to go after. Um. So that brings me to a question now, and uh, I thought about it. Like, this is very innovative, and the results are very exciting. Um, I, I, I hope, like, in the next year or so, it will be available uh, in one of the centers that I work in, too, to try it. But, like, going back to the early days of Q, how yeah. and why they chose to target this pathway and like what was the thinking process of creating this drug and if you don't know that's completely fine but it's interesting question for people who are trying to innovate there and find a similar targets or pathways to treat like how did this idea came about yeah so it's, it's an outstanding you know question and I, i've been with q now three and a half years mm -hmm. Um, I'm actually was very familiar with the company all the way back. I, I, I uh, as a consultant, worked with the company to prepare the IND on the first drug with, with mm -hmm. the immunosuppressant about five years ago. Um, and so, you know, the, the the premise here, the concept was, you know, and Q um, basically refers to, you know, sort of taking the, the nature's cues, okay, to modulate the immune system. So in, 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 in cancer, to turn on anti-tumor adaptive immunity and T cells. And we also have a preclinical autoimmune pipeline, which does the converse. But so the thought was, well, what would be a good specificity, okay, and, and tumor to go after? And so, you know, the, 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 the first choice then ultimately was to, to go with a virally driven, okay, tumor, right? And so viral is, is not self. OK, and so I, I think the scientists and the company reason that it, it was it would make sense to choose a foreign antigen, you know, a, a cancer with with a, with a foreign antigen target that was consistently expressed and that the immune response against against this would naturally be stronger than an immune response against a self protein. OK, because there's no tolerance right against this because it's a viral protein. It's it's an you know it's an infectious agent. The second drug that we brought in the clinic is called Q102, and it's the identical uh, platform construct. But instead of the E7 HPV peptide, now this has a peptide of Wilms tumor one, and so Wilms tumor one is a, a tumor antigen. Okay, so it's a it's an oncofetal protein. It's expressed during embryogenesis and then goes away, except for a couple of tiny traces and a couple of tissues. And so um, this uh, is expressed at very high levels. Okay, in, in a whole set of liquid tumors and solid tumors. So so in, in AML, it's expressed in almost 100% of cells at a high level. WT1, it's overexpressed. And then if you go and look in other cancers, so we're, we've treated now 40 patients uh, in, in a dose escalation and expansion with colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, gastric cancer, and ovarian cancer. And so that's where we started in the clinic, is that basket of indications. Um, 
but but there's a very strong interest in taking our, our 102 immunostat uh, into patients with leukemia AML. Um, we have a leading investigator in glioblastoma who wants to take it into glioblastoma. So, so it, it's been a target that's been investigated with uh, cancer vaccines, um, but, but none terribly successfully, unfortunately. So, so what we're seeing to date is really, really encouraging. So we see expansion of, uh, of tumor reactive, WT1 reactive T cells in these patients. We see um, reductions in tumor burden in advanced patient with ovarian, advanced patient with gastric cancer. This is just during dose escalation. Um, and then uh, uh, quite a, a fair bit of, of just disease stabilization. And so, uh, as I'm sure you know well, right, in, in your experience in overseeing and doing phase one trials in oncology, right, that, that, that incredible, you know, these, these are late lines of treatment. So colon cancer patients have gotten at least five or six lines before they see a Q102. But in pancreatic cancer, for example, you know, we have two or three patients that, that um, again, being treated in the second or third line. So they, they, they received frontline therapy, then a second line therapy. And then, uh, as you know well, unfortunately, not many of these patients are around for many more lines of therapy. But, uh, you know, we, we have uh, three patients now with, uh, that, that have experienced disease stabilization, you know, so without, you know, absence of resist defined progression for six months, one up to eight months. And so that's, you know, piqued the interest of some of our investigators. Um, and then, uh, again, ultimately, well, I think it, 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 we'll, we'll, our plan is uh, to look for the next rational combination of Q102 in patients with a WT1 uh, overexpressing tumor, um, where, where, again, we would hope to see what we saw with 101 in, HEP, in HPV-driven cancer, that when you add... Ano uh, again, another agent here, which is a checkpoint blockade agent that you somehow enhance, you know, the ability of the immunostat to expand relevant anti-tumor T cells, to have durable responses, to have, um, you know, a response rate that, that's close to, 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 to 50 percent. All right. And that, that's a very different picture, right? If you can tell your patient, but to, you know, for example, patients with low PDL1 expression or CPS scores less than 20 in head and neck cancer, for example, have a uh, a response rate that's actually less than 19 percent. It's 14 percent. Yeah, and it's very sad. Like those patients, like you don't, don't put them on this drug. It's is it going to work or it's not? But you don't have any options, right? Like it's it's, yeah. it's very dissatisfying. And, and so what we've observed is a response rate um, across uh, levels of PDL1 expression that's 50%. There's no difference. Um, and, and so something about this combination overcomes or, or, or whatever it is. I mean, I, I, it, get, it gets complicated trying to interpret what, what that, that means. Um, uh, it, it, you know, with, with regard to whether the, the, the PD L1, you know, expression, the, the PDL1 CPS expression uh, is just telling you about a hot or cold tumor or, or how immunologically active a tumor is. But in the case when you come in with a combination, it, it overcomes whatever is sort of more immunologically cold or inactive. But that, that's just kind of hypothesizing. You know, Do you I, think that maybe the target that you are looking for, like the PDL1 here, maybe it's not the right marker to look for to guide us to? Maybe this is the right treatment or not? Well, you know, it's a great question. It's 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 the it's the best thing that's come up to date um, in, in terms of checkpoint therapy, checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Yeah. Um, but it's not a great one, no. Um, and so again, you know, we always build in sort of exploratory biomarker assays and um, you know, it's too early now, there's too small numbers of patients, but in, in the combination with the immunostat, is, is there something that we can use as a biomarker to identify those patients that really that, that respond? Okay, and because the PD, uh, the CPS, um, um, uh, you know, uh, expression level, the PDL1 expression level, just gives you kind of a trend. You know, if you're greater than 20, you're more mm -hmm. likely to respond. If you're less than 20, you're less likely. Yeah, exactly. And it's not like 
it's not causality it's an association and some patients like even with low pdl1 might respond and do great exactly exactly and that that's precisely what you know i've gotten to know through through working with really a great set of 15 investigators on a trial in the us and um you, you know and when it when, when it really comes to practice there's much more of that <laughs> to consideration you know in making decisions and you know and so so again having something that that's that's more predictive uh, uh, of course would, would would be fantastic if if we can get there yeah gotcha i want to switch gears toward another topic and um, i want to talk more about you and so dr levy said i went through your background and you have an impressive background through uh, from academia to pharma and industry uh, so we talked earlier about uh, your work with Pfizer, with DNA Tricks, with Dauntless. Uh, can you take me to the early days and tell me how your career shaped after you left medical school? What happened? How did you end up here? Well, yeah, it's been a long, seems like a long circuitous route. All right. So um, I, I initially... Um, uh, matched into a general surgery program uh, oh, wow. on the Stead Hopkins. And so I matched um, uh, as a Halstead resident at, at Hopkins in 96 when I graduated from medical school and, and very quickly um, realized that I had made a mistake. <laughs> and so I, I spent one year. So I did an internship in general surgery. Oh, okay. And, realized that I that this was just too much for me. I mean, I, I just to be honest about it. I mean, I thought I could do everything when I was in medical school, but it was physically, emotionally exhausting. Other parts that I really enjoyed talking to patients, some of the more academic work, you know, I, I missed. And so I went back to Chicago, actually, and, and did research for a year with uh, an immunologist and an endocrinologist that I knew as a medical student, um, and then decided that internal medicine would be a better fit. And, and, and so I did a residency in internal medicine. Um, and, and then one of my mentors at the time, Ken Polonsky, who is a, an endocrinologist, uh, and I was going to do my fellowship with him in, in Chicago and with Jeff Lusto in immunology, because I was fascinated by autoimmune endocrine disease. And so he ended up moving to Univ uh, Wash U in, in St. Louis and invited me to check it out. So I ended up going to Washington University in St. Louis um, for a clinical fellowship in endocrinology and a postdoc in immunology in a lab of a very fam famous immunologist, Emily Unanaway. And I ended up staying there um, for nine years. Um, and so I completed my clinical fellowship um, and, and, and then spent three months a year attending at Barnes Hospital in general internal medicine uh, and doing, um, you know, and endocrine consult service and, and a half day a week of uh, out, outpatient clinic and endocrinology. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had my own lab, you know, so so I had a, a sort of the, the, you know, the academic medicine uh, setup, which was a lot of fun, you know, for a while. And, and then at a certain point, I, I must say, I stopped having fun. And, and I found it to be really pretty highly competitive, very, very onerous in terms of the amount of work for the reward that one could anticipate. Trying to get grants and funding constantly is just a, a pain. And, and perhaps most importantly, I, I, it became evident to me that, you know, I never was going to make any great stride or discovery or cure type 1 diabetes. You know, I mean, I, I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't some, you know, brilliant you know, Nobel Prize winning scientist who was going to, you know, I, I just, that was clear to me that, that I, it was limited what I, what I thought I could achieve. And I also was focused on this very, very narrow question of, you know, what, what are the molecular levels, you know, at, 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 at the T cell receptor, the MHC peptide complex uh, in type 1 diabetes that results in the loss of tolerance to self. And I was really focused on autoimmune diabetes. And so then after nine years there, I, I uh, this is about 15 years ago, I had a friend who had um, gone into pharma and said, Matteo, you should come check this out. I think you might like this. 
And so I went on a couple of interviews with a couple of big farmers, and then I and then I, I I took a job offer at Merck Research Labs in Rahway, wow. and uh, and so I started in at Merck as an associate director, where I was a medical monitor on a huge global trial in in endocrinology and bone metabolism, and I spent two years at Merck, which was a fantastic um, entree into industry. So just a really incredibly good group super high quality clinical researchers. Um, but then I just kind of missed some of the earlier science, you know, and translational parts of medicine, like taking things into patients for the first time and being, being, you know, really at the sort of cutting edge of taking something novel for the first time into patients. And, and then I, I got contacted in, in about an opportunity uh, at Pfizer in La Jolla, California, um, working in early clinical development, and and um, so I took that, and, and I spent four years at Pfizer in early clinical development, and that's where I really branched out from from endocrinology and metabolism, mm -hmm. uh, in more uh, immunology mm -hmm. uh, development and oncology. So you know, I had rotated through through you know oncology services as a resident, you know, but yes. And at the UFC, that was great, but I was not an oncologist. But but by the time I, I, I completed, you know, four years at um, uh, at Pfizer, I was sixty percent of my effort was running uh, uh, early phase one oncology trials. And so I took, gosh, five of the ADCs that Pfizer was developing in two thousand and fourteen, you know, into the clinic, mm -hmm. the different cancer indications and. And and so you know over several years, we really learned quite a bit about certain areas of, of oncology and most importantly just drug development. So 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 the principles of drug development go across therapeutic area. Um, but I, I was re re really motivated um, as I am today, you know. And and then 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 I did did a little bit of a sidewinder where where I, I was recruited to to go to Roche in Basel, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. For a year to to build immunology inflammation group. Um, that must and that must be a really nice trip, Switzerland. It was yeah, well, I thought it would be, but um, it was tough at the time. I have two daughters that were little, and my wife. Okay. We were living in La Jolla. I don't know. We live in I live in Southern California. Yeah, so the weather made a huge difference for you, right? <laughs> yeah, and just like the, the culture and the climate and things. So. The job was great, and I, I got a lot done. But 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 it, I was working like crazy, and then my family was not happy, and they wanted to come back. And so that's how I ended up coming back to San Diego and working at Marathi um, mm -hmm. Therapeutics, which was a lot of a lot of fun. Um, and and the the CEO of Marathi was my boss at Pfizer before, and so he had asked if I would come oversee and set up their immunotherapy combinations with their small molecule TKIs that they were doing in, in lung cancer, which are immunomodulatory with, with checkpoint inhibitors in, in renal and lung cancer. And so I spent two years there. And um, I kind of move on once I kind of learn all that I can learn from a certain experience. Yeah, I, I can see this trend, which is very interesting because like you're always looking into a new challenge and you are looking new new opportunity. And I think uh, many physicians right now are like they are trying to find a way through pharma and innovation. Um, and that brings me like I, I want to go back a bit. So you made the transition from academia to pharma. Uh, and then you were able to, uh, once you were in pharma, you were able to like branch to other pharma companies. So yeah. what do you think helped you to make that transition from academia? Like if someone right now, an academic physician listening to this, what advice would you give them that help you to make that transition from academia to pharma? Should they do like postdocs? Should they focus on research? Like what's the secret sauce? That's a good question. So at least for me, uh, you know, what I would say is one of the most important things is to be very, very open minded um, to, to learning um, about all sorts of different areas that you probably will have had zero exposure to. OK, I love that. I agree. Yeah. Zero. OK. And I never thought, you know, it, 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 it with my whole academic career, one of my first programs at Merck that I was assigned to was 
Um, so this is a group that developed Fosamax for osteoporosis, right? So before that, osteoporosis wasn't recognized as a disease. Okay, so so you know this ended up being a, an enormously important um, advance in, in in medicine, you know, um, and and so um, Fosamax, which is alendronate, you know, it was a blockbuster drug for Merck for over a decade, you know, over well over a billion in sales for over 10 years. And um, one of my, 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 I was assigned to the program where I, I was working with a team based on uh, the Merck partner Shigai in, uh, was it Shubai? Yeah, in Japan, to try to make a capsule or a tablet of Fosamax and vitamin D in combination, right, which mm -hmm. became a, a branded product for Merck, um, that was small enough, okay, for Japanese women to swallow, okay? <laughs> and I thought, like, what, this is what, you know, we got a team of 20 people that are going to work on I this. And, small. <laughs> you know? And so, um, apparently, okay, and, and so there, there's really clear market research in, in that in the culture and in Japan, pills above a certain size are, are, are not marketable, and in this case, it's women that need to take it because it's for osteoporosis. Okay, so that that was a, a blockade to having a successful product, even though all the clinical data was there, the clinical trials were done. That that was done. Okay, and and so then it really came down to like formulation science. Okay, and so I, I for two years had this incredible, you, you, you know, uh, learning in this world of formulation science okay oh, wow. and, and this gets into hardcore chemistry properties of the drugs of the excipients of spray drying them how you formulate little emulsions and droplets and, and you know i found that to be fascinating okay and then you know they wanted my input from or my team you know i mean at the time i was very junior you know uh, on the clinical aspects of this or that or you know, what will this do to the bioavailability and what, you know, so, so this was a whole realm of something that I would have never thought about in my whole career, but I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Um, and we ultimately failed in making a, a tablet or capsule. Um, and so we ended up doing a sachet, which is, uh, it's a little, like a little sugar. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just sprinkle it on, you know, yogurt or, or applesauce or something. But that's just one example, right? And so, you know, I, I, I got very involved with with the whole question of reimbursement, market access, target a product profile for a program that I championed at Pfizer for type one diabetes. Mm -hmm. And so, as a trained endocrinologist, immunologist, it was a natural fit, and I, I ran the trials that that took us through phase two in an anti IL seven receptor antibody. Um, that mm -hmm. looked very promising, um, but but then you know had to interact with the business unit um, at Pfizer to really create a value proposition that would support further development. Okay, and 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 so that that gets into really learning about you know what 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 determines uh, mar market access, um, what's reimbursed, why and how, how do you over overcome barriers because. The payers just said, well, we have insulin, you know, that, that's good enough. But as any physician or endocrinologist knows, you know, any uh, little bit of endogenous function you have, you have better health for the rest of your life. So that, that was shown in the DCCT trials. So, um, you know, if you imprint, you, you, you know, even two more years of endogenous um, non-diabetes glucose control, those patients will live longer and they'll have less uh, morbidity. And so it's very cool that in the last year and a half, the, the, a drug was approved to delay the onset of diabetes by two years. But just working through and getting to kind of understand all the forces, all the things that have to come together to develop uh, a medicine, okay, that's going to be successful, ultimately get approved, get to patients and have provide benefit. And so back to your question, I mean, it, it certainly one is to be open uh, about learning, you know, in all these different areas where you, 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 you may be uncomfortable because you don't know, uh, you don't know them, but welcome those opportunities. 
welcome opportunities to work across therapeutic areas that you you're you're not the subject matter expert in. And then the the the, the other thing. <laughs> which I, I've, I've only recognized more so in the last five years, um, is, is in pharma and biotech, I'm constantly in a position where I have to make decisions, okay, with limited data, okay? Um, but, but my job is to make the right decisions, right? And, and to make good decisions. But you have to get to a point um, where you have to feel comfortable in that space. And that's not consistent with the academic medicine uh, mindset. Okay. Yeah, I agree. So I, I, I recruited this fancy MD PhD from Dana Farber, you know, who was on the faculty at Harvard for over 10 years, you know, and he's my senior director now, a medical monitor, brilliant guy. Um, but in, in the over three years of that, I've, I've sort of, uh, you know, had him work with me. The, the greatest challenge has been to, to, to get him to that point, you see, to feel comfortable making decisions, providing the input that's asked of us with, with incomplete information. And, and you're never going to have the level of scholarship that you did in your area in academics, right? Because you, you're going to be pulled into another indication. You're going to be pulled in, in, into areas that, that you just you know, had a few weeks to learn about. Um, but, but, you know, you, you still can develop a skill set and you have to. Um, cause, um, you, you do have, uh, with, with the medical background and that, that, you know, what, what, what's being um, asked for, it's just a question of being comfortable with delivering it with a certain degree of confidence and, um, takes a little while, but, 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 you know, some folks who don't make the transition so well, I think they don't, um, they don't change or they're, 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 they're fundamentally. Okay, and how they approach, uh, you know, their work, and and, and you you have it to have a flexibility that that uh, is it's certainly not taught or groomed in in academic medicine. I'll say that. Gotcha. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That brings us to the end of the episode. That was very very helpful and insightful. Well, thank you so much. Now, this has been a pleasure. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.